Uh, so globalization knowledge and development, that is the topic of this lecture. So what would I do in this? Now, first of all, when we look at globalization, there are a number of phases of globalization. It's not just one single thing which happens in one period of history. There is, for instance, there is one is one feature of one factor of globalization or an aspect of globalization is what we call commodity trade. So that a commodity may be consumed, produced in one area or one country and consumed in another. So this means a manner of globalization so that commodities are transferred from the production area to a consumption area. And this goes quite a far way back in history. For instance, in, in Mesopotamia, they have found remains of till, you know, till oil seeds, which were are not originally grown in Mesopotamia, but obviously came from the Indus or the, uh, the, the Harappan civilization in the India-Pakistan region. So that was a early form of globalization where something produced in one country was consumed in another. More recently, we've had say the export of capital, which you will be familiar with as students of economics, either as a FDI or the, sorry, I'm not sure how this, hmm. okay. So the export of capital, which is through foreign direct investment, often conducted by what we call multinational corporations. But in the current period, there is a new form of globalization, which we call a global value chain or a global production network. What does that mean? It means that there's a splintering of production by tasks, meaning that all of the tasks of producing a particular commodity or a product are not produced in one country, but are produced in many countries around the world. For instance, the phones which you all will be using are say a smartphone. The Apple smartphone is designed in California or the laptop I'm using is also designed in California. You will find, if you look at the back of the Apple laptop, you will see it is written assembled in China. And the part, they don't write anything more than that, but the parts are produced in various other countries of Asia or the world, and they are assembled in China. So therefore, this is a splintering. That is, there's a breaking up of production across not just firms, but across countries. So that is the characteristic form of a globalization today. And more than 80% of the world trade is actually conducted in this manner, where commodities cross or the product components of a product cross boundaries. For instance, in the current pandemic situation, you know, there has been discussion and the CEO of the Serum Institute said, look, we are having trouble producing vaccines because a number of the components which come from the USA have been blocked by the US for export. So you can't just produce vaccine, all of it in one country. It is produced across a number of countries, various parts are produced. And then the Serum Institute of India puts it together as what we are, what is now being called COVID shield. So it's not just smartphones which are produced in this manner. Almost all the products that we utilize are in one way or the other produced across value chains. Now, there are also two other forms of globalization, one of which is the movement of labor, which is a movement of labor across from one country to another. You know, Indian IT engineers working in the USA, you have Sundar Pichai, or you have others who are now CEOs of various US tech companies. They studied in India and they have gone across and they work over there. So this is also a form of globalization. So there are many other forms which are of labor. And now you have yet another form, which is of digital connectedness. So there's a flow of information and there's the networks of knowledge, which really are spanning countries. For instance, when I was working on, well, in the work that I do on global value chains, I edit a series for the Cambridge University Press with its headquarters in Cambridge and its office here in Delhi. And we have a series of editors 
two of whom are in the USA, one in the three in the US, one in the UK, one in Italy, one in South Korea, one in China, and myself. So this is a this is a flow of information and a network of knowledge which goes across the world. So all of these are aspects of globalization. So when we look at the global economy, now there are two critical transformations that we have to deal with. I presume a lot of you or most of you, almost all of you must be teachers of economics. So you would know that there are two areas that we refer to, two aspects that we refer to. One is what we call the great divergence. What is the great divergence? It is what happened at the end of the 18th century when Western Europe began to diverge from Asia, particularly in per capita income. Western Europe per capita income began to grow and that of, uh, while that of Asia stagnated or even fell. That is the period of what is known as the Industrial Revolution. Currently, we are in what is some people called a great convergence where there is a catch up. You can see the catch up, particularly in the case of, as we will see later on, a country like South Korea, which has gone from having been a low income country in 1950 to becoming a high income country now. China is also very much on the verge of catch on in the area of catch up. India has gone a bit ahead, but still somewhat behind these countries. So what is the overall, how does this divergence show in terms of income? Now, this is the data I've put together and I've not really done this. This is from Deepak Nair's book on catch up. He has a more recent book on convergence which is which will in, encompass all this but see what happened to gdp per capita if we take western europe as the standard 100 from 1820 to 1950 japan fell from 56 in 1820 to 31 in 1950 but look at what happened to china and india they fell from 50 percent of the gdp per capita to only 7% in 1950, or in the case of India, from 45% to uh, 10%. So that is the great divergence that we, that I referred to. This is the great divergence in world history. Now, is there a catch up? This is not the recent data, not the latest. They will, you'll find the latest data in Deepak's new book on convergence. So here, it, you will see on top, the uh, per capita GDP of Asia, which went from 202 in 1970 to two, uh, 4,300 in 2010. The industrialized world, which is what we call the high income countries, went from 2,800 to about 39,000. So they grew even more. But there is a slight catch up, which you can see. If I make it as a percentage, that's why you will understand whether it's a catch up or not. In, in, in 1970, Asia was only 7% of the industrialized world's GDP, but then in 2010, it had come up to becoming 11%. So there is a bit of catch up. If I take data more recently, you will sign that there's even more of a catch up, particularly after in, in the 2010s. And now of course, there's a bit hard lull, but overall, this, there is a change in the distribution of per capita income across the different countries. Now, this is not very clear on the slide over here, but you will have it in your slides and you can look at it. Now, this shows you the distribution of, sorry, let me just make it a little bigger, the distribution of countries by groups of income. Actually, the, it, these blue lines show you the middle, the low income, the lowest line is the low income countries. The middle two lines are the middle income countries. The top line is the high income countries. Now it gives the uh, distribution of GDP per capita from 1950 to 2010. And you will see the three black lines, which are going across the different per capita groups. So China, the bottom of the black line, the lowest black line started at just above 400 in 1950. It has now gone up in uh, 2010 to more than 6,400. But look at the most dramatic, that is Korea and Taiwan. Taiwan started at a little higher, for, uh, a little higher in 1950, but look, both Taiwan and Korea are now part of the 
high income group. So you see that there is a movement across from low to middle to high income. That's the important thing. So it is not as though those that were low income in 1950 have remained low income in, nine, in 2010. Rather, a few, particularly the East Asian countries are the ones which have moved forward and clearly have caught up. So how did this happen? I would like to now turn to the question of how we utilize the, the, the notion or the uh, concept of global value chains and look at how this change came about. So what is a global value chain? It is based on the management doctrine, which was actually first formulated by the Indian management guru, Pralad, who talked about core competence, that a company should concentrate on its core competence and outsource the rest. What does that mean? It means that if I'm a teacher, I don't try to do everything else like which is not related to teaching, but I outsource the other work. For instance, uh, well, in a college, you have many types of jobs, which finally give the teachers lectures to you as a student. You have a job of keeping the classrooms ready for lectures. You have a job of preparing various materials, and these are all given to various other people. So there is a core competence, and you then utilize others to carry out certain tasks. Now, when this goes between companies, then you call it a manner of what is called vertically specialized uh, industrialization. So you have companies like Airtel or IBM, which specialize in certain areas. You know, Airtel, the Indian telecom company, it does not do its own IT work. What does it do? It gives its IT work to IBM. Why? Because IBM is specialized in it and it can provide it at a much lower cost being at a higher scale. But of course, so this is the specialization within a production system. But for this specialization to become offshoring, then there must be a difference in production costs. Therefore, there has to be some kind of labor cost, but also environmental and other costs. So there is, as a result of it, what we call labor arbitrage. That means you utilize the different labor, uh, the wages in different countries to be able to increase the increase the extent, uh, increase the overall profit. Sorry. Oh, why is it not? Okay, I have to do it here. I'll skip this. So what is it, therefore, as a result of that, what does the GVC contain? It contains one a lead firm and then a number of suppliers. So there's an input output structure so that the inputs of one firm become out, uh, uh, outputs of one firm become inputs of another. And all of these are put together finally by the lead firm. There is a, in, in putting it together or in distributing the tasks, there is what is called a governance system, okay? So that the lead firm then decides who will do what in the whole distribution of tasks. There's of course also a distribution of knowledge of revenue but what I want to emphasize that is the distribution of knowledge in tasks. What are these tasks? At a broad level, these are the tasks of what is pre-production, which is design or branding, and then production, and then post-production. So look at a garment firm, like say, well, I can take Adidas or Levi's, yeah? Levi's designs jeans. The denim for jeans is to a large extent produced in India by a company called Arvind, which produces about 40% of the world's denim. That is stitched into the jeans according to the specifications provided by uh, Levi's. And then that those are the production tasks. And then there's a the post-production task, which is of the branding and the, uh, and, and the marketing. So these are the three broad areas, pre-production, which is design, production, which is manufacture, and post-production, which is branding and marketing. Now, within this, however, it's not as though each part of that has a equal role. The GVC structure, has a monopoly strength of the lead firms, right? These are the, what we call the complex knowledge segments. 
which are monopolized by the lead firms? What is the complex knowledge segment? That is the, say the knowledge of design. It's more easy to produce something than to design something. Not, uh, design has a lot of what's called tacit knowledge involved while production is mainly uh, implicit, uh, straightforward knowledge, which is, which is easily translatable into instructions. So the lead firms are in the high complex knowledge segments, while the suppliers like the Indian garment manufacturers or the Chinese or the Bangladeshis are in easy to enter low and medium knowledge segments, which is like what we call cut, make, trim. I mean, you have the uh, design for, the, for a jeans, pair of jeans, and then you have the instructions. So you cut the fabric according to the requirement, you make it, you stitch it together, and then you add all the trim. So here it is an easy to enter low and medium knowledge segment, and therefore there's a high level of competition. So we have to distinguish the areas which have very little competition, where there's a monopoly, which is the GVC's uh, lead firms, and where there is a uh, competition, which is the suppliers. Now, you also know that even if these are monopolies, they also become, I'm not used the term over here, but they also become monopsonies, meaning that there are few buyers and many sellers. So there are few buyers of denim, there is there's Levi's, there's Wrangler, there is say, Armani, but there are many, many suppliers or of garments. There are many suppliers. So this difference leads to a difference in the strength in the market. Now, what this difference according to knowledge levels means is that if you are in the same industry, it doesn't mean that you're in the same segment. For instance, China has a very large industry of consumer electronics, including the manufacture of iPhones, iPads, etc. But are they in the same segment as the USA? As I mentioned, the USA mainly carries out the design of the uh, product and it is assembled in China. So these are two very different segments. If an iPhone or the iPhone costs about say, how much does it now cost? Maybe 80, 90,000 rupees. Out of that 90,000 rupees, only 5,000 accrues in China as the cost of assembly. The rest of it is in the rest of the world. Half of the iPhone is profit to Apple. So 50% is profit, which is very, very high. So the point is that these are in two very different segments and the people who work in these are also of very different quality. For instance, uh, in the ICT, in the information and communication technology industry, both USA and China have very large numbers in that. But look at this in terms of distribution of the educational levels. In the USA, only 5% of workers in ICT are below high school, while in China, 45% are below high school. And look at the last row. In China, only 5% uh, have a, a college degree, while in the USA, 45% have a college degree in the ICT. So obviously, though they are both, we call them both the ICT, they are very different parts or segments of the ICT industry. Now, in this, there is a distribution within this value chain, where the distribution of tasks, which leads to a distribution of income. So the rents or the high profits are in the, uh, in the tasks which are carried out in the high income countries, which also are called science by some headquarter economies. And only competitive profits are earned by the supplier, suppliers in the low income countries. So for instance, you know, now, uh, if, you know Foxconn, you may have heard of Foxconn, which assembles most of China's uh, iPhones and iPads and the MacBook, et cetera. Their rate of return is not even 5% on capital or their margin, not, not rate of return on capital, sorry. Their margins are less than 5% because of the, but they have very high volumes. And on the other hand, as I mentioned to you, uh, the, 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 the margin of, Apple is about 50%. So you can have a very high rate of profit in 
those areas which we call, which I mentioned earlier, pre-production and post-production. But in production, there's a very low level of profit because the first two, that is pre-production and post-production are monopolies and the knowledge there is monopolized, for instance, through patent rights, et cetera, while the production is not monopolized and there the rate of returns are very low. Now, this is the same for, this has been put into what is called a smile curve. You know, this is a kind of roughly a smile. And in the bottom here in the middle, the bottom is the manufacturing part where the rate of return is very low. On the left-hand side is the pre-production and on the right-hand side is the post-production. So these are the two post-production and pre-production where the rates of return are very high while in the production segment, the rate of return is very low. So this is the broad, the distribution, broadly the distribution of profits. Now, I will give you a contemporary example. We all know about the, uh, what is it? Serum Institute of India. The Serum Institute of India produces the vaccines which were designed, which were actually created by the Oxford University laboratories given to the Anglo-Swiss firm AstraZeneca, which then made it into a product and got a monopoly on it through intellectual property rights. <clears throat> Usually, most of these products have some kind of intellectual property rights, either a patent or a kind of brand or a, a, a trademark registration. So you can't use the name Levi's, you can't use the name Gap. Only those who, who own it can use that. Or you, or you, or you have a Apple computer, or you have medicines which are produced or which have been designed and uh, created in, in, in laboratories, largely public funded laboratories, but then handed over to companies like Pfizer or AstraZeneca for their production for their commercialization. AstraZeneca gives the production to Serum Institute of India. Serum Institute of India earns a very small profit, though it has a high margin, though it, sorry, it has a high volume, but the high profits are earned by AstraZeneca and Pfizer. Right now there's a dispute going on. India and South Africa have proposed to the WTO that the uh, intellectual property rights or patent protection should be withdrawn for vaccines and they should be allowed to be produced anywhere in the world. But the Western countries are not agreeing. The US seems to be leaning towards agreeing with India and South Africa. But you will see that therefore, the monopolization of knowledge through patents of other forms of intellectual property rights is really critical to the earning of high profits in the, in the, uh, in the world economy. Okay, so I saw, we saw that there is a distribution of income within a value chain where the low end is manufacture, the pre-production and post-production and the high ends, which are not undertaken by the low income countries. So do we have to be stuck in this or can there be a movement upwards? Now, the point is, yes, uh, you will see in this slide, I give a number of examples of how this can be a movement. We call it uh, different kinds of uh, upgrading can be undertaken. It can be a process. There can be process innovation. There can be, uh, there can be what's called full package supply. So that you don't just cut, make and trim, but do some part of the overall transformation of say a design into a product. And therefore the supplier revenues may go up and the tasks may go up, but the volume goes up overall. So there, ha there can be a process of upgrading within a global value chain. But what is the essential element in this upgrading? It is knowledge. Knowledge is what allows you to take on new tasks. You need capital, sure, but you can always, you can always get capital on the market. But what you need is knowledge. And that is the key element in building these capabilities. So what is the rough definition of knowledge? It is we take it as the capacity to solve problems and to not just solve, but to anticipate what we need to do. So that we have a design in our mind that, okay, we need, if we want to get X, we need to do Y, then we will get X, the result. Now within a GVC, is there a knowledge transfer when you work together? 
there's very limited knowledge transfer from what we have un, from what we have seen the brands or the lead firms don't mind the suppliers learning more about production but they don't want them to take over the core functions which are of design brand and market because of that's where they earn their profits and they want to keep their monopolies in that now the supplier firms try their own strategies, like say by reverse engineering. So you have collaborated with a company in producing a product, and then you go on, on your own and you try to make it by what's called, by breaking it down and carrying out reverse engineering. In, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, Tata's had a collaboration with Mercedes-Benz to produce trucks. And then they reverse engineered all of that, which they had learned, which they were doing for Mercedes Benz. And now they produce their own trucks. So it requires the firm to undertake this reverse engineering, but you also need support from the R&D sector in the country. I mean, without an R&D sector, both within the firm and in the nation, you can't really un undertake this type of upgrading uh, where you even learn through reverse engineering. Okay, so I'll just summarize uh, the, some of these things. So there's a linkage between knowledge and capabilities. The high income countries and the low income countries are specialized at two ends of the knowledge spectrum. That is the high income end, uh, high knowledge end in the high income countries and the low knowledge end in the low income countries. The middle income countries are less specialized. They have both of these. China, for instance, has both. It has both the high knowledge spectrum, and it also has the low knowledge spectrum, and it has the middle also. So the, MI, the middle income countries or MICs over here are therefore less specialized. So the development question which we have, and in a way which I have put to you as a question for you to answer, how do middle income countries move to more of the high rent activities which are design and innovation of products? So there has to be a development policy which will allow you to be able to move into the, through what is known as the middle income trap. Now, what is a middle income trap? Going back one slide earlier, so there are the two slides, okay? So if you have companies that are mainly carrying out the, which are the LIC companies, mainly carrying out the assembly of products, and then you move further through them to carry out what is called full package supply, then you may become a middle income country. Like many countries of uh, Asia and, and Latin America have moved to middle income status. For instance, Sri Lanka, Maldives, India, Pakistan, now Bangladesh very soon will perhaps or will overtake India in per capita income. It will also be a middle income country. So many have moved to middle income country, but very few have moved into becoming a high income country. So that is what we largely call the middle income trap. You can move more easily from LIC to MIC, but moving from MIC to HIC is much more difficult and something that very few countries have actually managed to do. So it's like moving from what, what I call reverse engineering of trucks. India is very good at reverse engineering of trucks, but we are not as good in the development of new trucks. In fact, for the first time, we have actually developed a new drug which is being marketed, and that is the Bharat Biotech ICMR drug, which uh, the vaccine. If you see all the vaccines, other than one from India and one from China, the rest have all been produced in the high income countries. So there is still a knowledge gap between the high income countries which produce new knowledge, produce new products and the low income countries or the middle income countries which are largely manufacturing this. So therefore, we now see there are two phases of development policy. The first phase one is when you move from low income to middle income, which is largely a matter of learning how to use technology and knowledge, manufacturing, learning manufacturing, and the second is when you move from middle income to high income, when you learn to innovate or create technology or knowledge. 
I will now go back again to the uh, graph I had shown you earlier. You will see here the black lines, which are the countries that have moved from low income into middle, upper middle or high income countries. Upper middle is China or almost high income country now and high, clearly high income country is Korea and, uh, and uh, Korea and, and uh, Taiwan. So how did they move out of this middle income country? So we go back to knowledge as a critical factor in the movement out of middle income country in being able to develop the ability to carry out innovation. You have to be able to carry out innovation, come up with new products, with cheaper products in order to be able to move through the middle income trap. In this, it's not just firms that are important. As I mentioned in the case of these pharmaceuticals, a lot of the research is actually done in the public sector and then given to the private sector to develop, uh, commercialize. In this, there is the importance of links with customers and a large customer base. For instance, in India, the customer base for uh, say high-end phones is much smaller than say in China or in the USA. Though of course India's population is much higher, but the customer base for high uh, value products is lower. So you need, however, a broad base of innovation efforts and you, you can utilize the capabilities when the new technologies are coming up because the older technologies are becoming redundant and a new country can then become capable, develop capabilities in the new technologies. For instance, right now, with artificial intelligence coming up as important, any country that becomes dominant in artificial intelligence will be able to very get, get a dominant position in the world economy. So moving out of the, uh, sorry, moving out of the middle income trap requires various types of innovation, which will be well, one thing that is there in favor of countries like China and India is that we can carry out what is also called frugal or reverse innovation. What is flu frugal? Frugal means, as the second line shows, to do more with less or to do better with less. For instance, the nano car is a very frugally designed car, simply basics. The shampoo sachet or shampoo of coffee, uh, you know, the sachet of coffee is a small value uh, product which can however have a large market in a low income country. Or you can have a, uh, you can have a ECG machine which actually has been developed in China or in India by not Indian companies, but by the multinationals themselves because they have developed them for low income markets. Now, these markets, these low income markets become a kind of frugal innovation, which can also become what is called reverse, meaning it will go back to the, to the original uh, headquarter companies to become important over there too. So going through these forms of uh, upgrading, there are a few areas which look important in being able to upgrade into the high income area. One is IT services. You know that the IT services have a very high net value added per worker. They're very high in that. The second one has been generic drugs, which by which India was able to develop and became what was known as the pharmacy of the developing world. And then the problems of upgrading, which is to full package supply and new drugs. And also within this, you can utilize the importance of certain choke, what are called choke point products, intermediates that become very important. You know, these are not final products like Microsoft Windows, which, well, is there on virtually every PC which is used around the world. So these are the main areas in which one may move out of the uh, take up in order to move out of middle income status. But in doing that, you need to develop lead firms, which will be able to carry out and therefore push forward this agenda of knowledge as the basis of the value chain. For instance, Korea has developed its own big lead firms like Samsung, LG and Hyundai. China has Huawei, Lenovo, Hire, Alibaba, and many others now which have come up. 
and India has a few, but not, but nothing really as big as these. There's Tata, there's Mahindra, there's Ready Labs, there's Bharat Biotech, but these are all much smaller. But these are the beginning of developing lead firms, which can therefore move the country into a higher uh, growth path. Now, within this developing a higher growth path, there is some some uh, some traps that one has to be careful of. For instance, the knowledge divide. There is a demand, both a demand and a supply of high knowledge workers. Now, India has done something. I know 15 years ago when I went to Italy to discuss value chains, so some colleagues asked me over there, how come India, which is such a poor country, has got such a large number of IT engineers all around the world? Now, the point is this. It's exactly this. It is easy to increase the supply of high knowledge workers, which is done through increasing gross tertiary en enrollment. So in the, we have increased our supply of high knowledge workers in the IT and in the medical profession, but our demand for them has not increased to the same extent. Therefore, we have become exporters of high knowledge workers. So what does the demand for high knowledge workers depend on? It depends on the extent of R&D within the country, both in the private and the public sector. Look at the figures below you at the bottom. India spends only 0.8% of its GDP on R&D. China already, it was 1.07%. It would be higher now, it is closer now to uh, 2%. USA is 2.6% of a very large GDP. And look at Korea, it's 2.0%. So Korea is the one country you will see over here. Sweden is even higher and Argentina is even lower than India. The two are clearly in what is known as the middle income trap where the demand for knowledge workers is just not keeping up, just not as high as the supply of knowledge workers. Now, this is a, the next slide shows you a figure graph where I think on the left hand, on, on the uh, y-axis, you have the, um, yeah, the R&D the to GDP ratio on the, on, on the vertical axis. So this is the demand for knowledge workers. On the x-axis, you have the gross enrollment in the tertiary education. So you look at South Korea, it is the one country which has moved from having a high, uh, 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 tertiary enrollment to developing its knowledge demand. And now it is along with these countries, which are the high income countries. So you can see a clear divide between high income countries, which have a high supply of knowledge workers and a high demand for knowledge workers. While you have countries like India over here, which have a high supply of knowledge workers, but a low demand for knowledge workers. So the one country which has really moved through, China shows here as still somewhat low, but I know the recent figure shows China somewhere here along with South Korea, because they have really developed their R&D system and they now have, do not have any more a, a short, a, a, sorry, a oversupply of knowledge workers like India does, which still does not have enough demand through R&D. R&D is the critical factor in determining demand for knowledge workers. So let's look a little more in detail at China. You have the two telecom equipment giants, ZTE and Huawei, who are in a battle with the USA to see who will dominate the 5G telecom technology in the world. These two companies are now the largest leading patent uh, filers in the world. China spends 2.18 of GDP on R&D against 2.4% for all the OECD countries together, while India just about 1% of GDP. China, R&D is concentrated in the top five companies, 30% of it, and that is equal to the US fortune in, uh, in fortune 500 companies. But of course, none of the uh, Chinese companies still within the top 100 global innovators. So, that was the on one side. On the other side, look at the uh, supply. Gross tertiary enrollment. Tertiary means college level and higher. It is 40% now, which was compared to what Korea was in 1992. Of course, Korea now has 
95% of gross tertiary enrollment. That means 95% of the educated go through into college level education. I don't have the figure for India, but you can imagine what it will be. It will be less than 10%. China's manufacturing wages have gone up. They're now $720 uh, dollars a month as against well Vietnam 250 or even Malaysia 600 has gone above that. They have brought MSCs, uh, that is the micro and small enterprises to the technological frontier. This shows the importance of managerial community of capabilities and they have been developing the knowledge economy. Now the World Bank has come up with a way of developing, it has developed some indicators for the knowledge economy, which are economic and institutional regime education and skill of population, the infrastructure and the innovation system. You put all these together, you know, these are all per hundred. For instance, telephones per thousand people, computers per thousand people. So India may have a large number of internet users, but per thousand people, it is very low. And that's what counts when you talk about the information infrastructure. So per, when you look at it per thousand persons, now this was then put into this kind of uh, spider's web. The black line, dark line is China, and the light line inside is India. You will see on every indicator, India is inside the Chinese web. That means it is lower than China in everything except in the rule of law, where it is well higher than in China. But that's the only thing. But everything else, in whether it is human development index or, or the internet users per thousand, or computers per thousand, or gross grocery involvement, India is lower than China. So therefore, you can see very well why the overall, there is a huge difference between the Indian and the Chinese economies. Okay, now I'll just try to summarize this in terms of a, how we can look at it. In terms of levels of development, so I'm putting forward the proposition that the per capita income of an economy depends on distribution of firms in different GVC segments where we differentiate them by knowledge levels in production. So the low income countries are mainly in low profit assembly. Middle income countries are mainly in full package production where there's medium income and high income countries are mainly in design and innovation. So how does this look in terms of putting it together I put it together into a three by three uh, figure. So you have high knowledge, medium knowledge and no knowledge. You'll have to read it as the across the diagonal like this. This is your low income country, <coughs> which earns low profits doing low knowledge work of assembly. This is your middle income country, which does full package supply, which earns middle income, medium income with medium knowledge activities. And these are your high income countries which carry out innovation, design, and high value services with high knowledge content and earning high profits. So that will summarize the way in which knowledge and income uh, per capita income are distributed in the world economy today. So I can look at the same thing. I just put it here in terms of low income countries. There it was in terms of the uh, we, uh, sorry, this is, the, this is actually the correct one for you to look at, that way you look at the countries and how they are divided by income level and knowledge level. So what will you find over here? That this is a low income country, you'll expect to find mainly assembly, like you have in Bangladesh. You will not find design and new products being developed in LICs. So that is the likely profile of a low income country but go to the high income country, you will find a lot of innovation design and high value services, but you will find very little assembly. So this is exactly why the US and UK have had problems like the rise of Trump. If you are a college educated person and can participate in innovation design and high value services in the USA or UK, you will do quite well. But if you are an, only a high school graduate, who depends upon a job in an assembly plant or in a, in a fast food job, fast food shop, then you're not going to do very well. So these are the people in the US and in the EU who have gained from globalization. And these are the people who have lost. While here in the low income country, 
they gained income by assembly, but they have yet to move along this direction from assembly to full package supply to innovation and uh, design. The same can be seen, again, a very similar uh, to the earlier one, where the knowledge economy and current economic performance, this is from the World Bank, so where the GDP per capita on the X or Y axis and the knowledge economy score on the X axis. So as you move to a higher knowledge economy score, you also move to a higher GDP per capita. That is the broad correlation between these two, which I have explained in terms of uh, how you can move across from one knowledge segment into another. Just one final point, because we have the, we are in a situation where clearly there is a struggle between the USA and China for who will dominate the coming, the rest of this 21st century. Now, this depends on what? Who depends, who dominates a, the world depends on who controls the technology of that age. If, if China is the one that will, will control the artificial uh, intelligence and the new technologies that are coming up, then it will control the, it will become the hegemonic power in the world. It's not just a matter of size, but it's also who controls the technology. So this is what I would uh, like to put forward before you, that please look into the manner in which knowledge uh, creates uh, the economic development and how that is related to different levels of development in the world economy. I've given you a few references over here uh, on the value chains, but there is two, one which is not here, which you should read, sorry, and that is the Deepak Nair's book on the resurgent Asia, which again summarizes in a way the, uh, that is a kind of background telling you how Asia has come up in the world economy. Okay, thank you. That is my lecture.